So uh, good evening, everyone. I want to thank you for uh, uh, joining me on a Friday evening. I was very impressed when I heard that uh, the University of North Texas had an uh, all-vegan dining hall, uh, the first one in the nation. And I had, uh, I, I even tried, my, both of my girls are in college. One's a, a sophomore, one's a junior. And I had tried to convince both of them, either one of them, to come over here to go to school just so I could come and visit and, and check out the dining hall. <laughs> Uh, so unfortunately, it wasn't until a few weeks ago that I finally got to make it, and we really enjoyed it. The chef, uh, when he heard that I was plant-based uh, uh, and also was going to come do a talk here, he got all excited, and we were talking for a long time, and he, he gave us a personalized tour of the place, and then he took us out back to the, the hydroponic farm. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about uh, preventing heart disease. The main message today is that I want to get across is that nutrition is key in the development of heart disease. So conversely, if you think about it, then nutrition is key in preventing heart disease. We are what we eat. It makes a lot of sense, but we've been ignoring that, and, and this is why Maya and I are particularly passionate about this, is because uh, we need to get back to understanding that uh, the, what we eat has a tremendous impact on our health. A little bit about me, I'm a vascular surgeon. Not many people really know what a vascular surgeon is, and I'll kinda, uh, that means I treat the blood vessels of the body. There are you know, maybe three types of Doc surgeons that treat the blood vessels of the body. The neurosurgeon treats the blood vessels inside the brain. The heart surgeon treats the blood vessels on the heart. And I treat the blood vessels everywhere else in the body. And then don't forget the cardiologist, who is a, not a surgeon, uh, will do uh, percutaneous procedures, uh, many, similar to many of the ones I do, uh, but to uh, do uh, treatments on the hearts like stents and angioplasties. So those might be the four types of physicians. So what I do is I don't only do surgeries, I don't only do angioplasties and stents, but I also do the medical therapy. My specialty is basically the equivalent of a cardiologist and a heart surgeon because there is no medical equivalent uh, in vascular surgery. So I will do chronic medical management of my patients as well, which might mean medications, uh, and, and then also near and dear to my heart, what I'm talking about today is lifestyle, okay? And the things that we can do in our lives to prevent and reverse wow. heart disease. I am the owner of North Texas Vascular Center, which, uh, so I have my own, uh, my own center. We hear about heart disease, coronary artery disease, atherosclerosis, hardening of the arteries. These are all essentially interchangeable. They all mean the same thing. Basically what, what that is, is heart disease is atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis is the buildup of plaque, or basically the hardening of the arteries. If you look at this picture I have here, it's a cross section of an artery. The yellow stuff is plaque. And plaque, and I'll explain what plaque is. Plaque is a kind of a generic term, for, and, and it's composed of multiple things. Uh, and, and, and those things are related to the risk factors and the things that we do to ourselves. But the buildup of plaque causes a narrowing in the artery. And then that narrowing of the artery can lead to consequences. So here's a, just another example. Up on the top right, I've still included that same picture I was talking about. But on the left side is an example of an art, uh, kind of a, what we call a coronal section of the artery, a longitudinal section, where you can see that the plaque is building up and narrowing the blood flow. And then downstream of that blockage is where symptoms will occur. When you talk about a blockage in an artery, wherever that blockage is occurring, the problem occurs downstream uh, because it's that downstream where blood needs to get to and it's not getting to. So this is very interesting. On the bottom right is an example of progression over time. The, the one on the left is a, an early on disease. The middle one is uh, fairly significant and the, at the end is very, very, very bad. Now, what I find interesting is atherosclerosis is a chronic, indolent, slow process, and it starts early on. We have a lot of young people in here, but guess what? Everyone in this room has atherosclerosis, okay? That, that people don't really understand that. Now, and it, so, and it starts at an early age, and this was demonstrated back in the 1950s. During the Korean War, uh, someone had the idea to go ahead and do autopsies on some of these young men coming back. So they took 300 consecutive uh, Vietnam War vets who had been killed in action and did autopsies on them. And, and they looked at various things, but one of the things they looked at was their blood vessels. And the average age of these 300 young men, you know, unfortunately war is a terrible thing, 22 years old. Okay, so they were very young. 77% of them had already developed meaningful plaque in their arteries. In other words, it was something that, you, it wasn't just microscopic, but it was visible to the naked eye. It was a sign that disease had already started. So let's fast forward to today. What we're finding out today, and what's, ha what's different from the 1950s to today, our diet has gotten worse, markedly worse. And so you fast forward to today, and uh, we are seeing uh, with uh, autopsies in, in young children, uh, in their you know, eight, nine, 10 years old, that they have signs. Of, uh, that left side is what we call a fatty streak. 
It's just where you see the yellow, but there's no uh, impingement on the, on the uh, lumen, or no, no narrowing, but there's the yellow streaks. We're seeing fatty streaks in kids. And now I learned something really interesting recently. I was in Houston at a talk, and I was uh, listening to one of my colleagues uh, who's also a lifestyle medicine specialist, but she's a maternal fetal medicine specialist. And in her talk, she said uh, they're finding fatty streaks in utero. Okay, so babies who are developing in a mother's womb already have signs of fatty streaks. So what's happening is the diet that the mother has, then it's impacting our babies and the disease is starting at an earlier age. Right here, I've got another example. This is actually, these aren't drawings, these are real arteries. The one on the left side is a, what, a normal artery. The one on the right side is an artery full of disease. The, uh, one of the first things that jumps out is, where's, what's the difference in the size of the opening? Arteries are living, breathing, physiological bodies. They're not just tubes. They're not just PVC or steel. They actually expand and they contract and things go in and out of them. They have, they're, they're, they have physiologic processes. And one of the things that really markedly controls that physiologic process is that very inner layer on the artery, and you can barely see it. It's like a little red line. It's, it's one cell layer thick, so it's very, very small. Uh, and you can, it's not visible to the naked eye. Um, and that's called the endothelium or, or the intima but I, I typically refer to it as the endothelium. It's extremely important in transporting uh, things in and out of the artery, oxygen, white blood cells, proteins, glucose, and it's also responsible for something else. It makes nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is a very important molecule. When the endothelium is destroyed, the natural function of the artery is markedly impaired. And if you look at the picture on the right, there is no endothelium. Okay, so this artery is a poorly functioning artery. Or what does nitric oxide do? It's the most important molecule. I think it's the most important molecule in the body, but I'm biased because I'm a vascular surgeon, okay? So yeah, you, you know, you ask a psychiatrist, they might think serotonin or dopamine is more important. But uh, so a nitric oxide is very important in, it's a powerful vasodilator, so it helps the arteries expand when you need more blood flow. It has tremendous blood flow pressure lowering effects. Importantly, it prevents atherosclerosis. It prevents this thing I'm talking about. It's essential for arterial health. When we develop disease and the endothelium is destroyed, well, it's a kind of a catch-22 or, or you're, you're spiraling. There's no nitric oxide to prevent further atherosclerosis and further atherosclerosis occurs. So it's a, it's a bad, it's a bad uh, process. So again, why is atherosclerosis so bad? Whatever the blood vessel is supplying can be impaired. I think of the art arteries and the blood within the arteries as the interstate highway system and the transport vehicles. You know, if, if the United States, if we lost our interstate and if we lost all of our truckers, we'd be in a big mess, wouldn't we? Well, and that's kind of essentially what's happening. The, the arteries supply every aspect of our body and that, therefore they carry whatever our body needs, whether it's, again, oxygen, which is essential, whether it's proteins, other molecules, uh, hormones, white blood cells to fight infection, or if you're getting an IV, uh, antibiotics to get to where the infection is. So basically, everything that needs to get somewhere in the body is carried by the blood vessels and the transport system. When there is a blockage, that's when injury occurs. So when you have a blockage to the heart arteries, you can have a heart attack, all right? Uh, if you have a blockage to the brain, you can get a stroke, okay? And interestingly enough, people don't understand this, but dementia, a great deal of dementia that exists out there today, and dementia is accelerating. It's going to be, the, the, the statistics are that uh, within the next 10 years, every one of us will know someone affected by dementia. We have an aging population. Uh, dementia affects people primarily over the age of 65, and so we're going to start seeing a lot more of it. The impact of dementia is going to be uh, uh, tremendous, both from a uh, societal aspect and from a financial aspect. So uh, stroke and dementia are the results of lack of blood flow to the brain. This is what I treat a lot of, and that's gangrene. Wow. Okay, so when people do not get blood flow down to their extremities, uh, they can develop gangrene. And how does that happen? Well, you know, when we start to develop blockages, our body can keep something alive with about even 40 to 50% of normal blood flow. But if you develop a cut or a scratch or a bug bite, um, well, then we don't have enough blood flow to heal those things. And instead of healing, they, uh, they get bigger. And, and, and gangrene is the, is the result. And so I do a lot of uh, therapies to uh, open up arteries to try to heal the gangrene. But unfortunately, I don't always win. I would probably say about 10% of the people who present to me present too late to the point where I can't do anything about it, though their disease is so extensive. This is very interesting. How many people knew that impotence 
uh, is a vascular problem. Not, you know, a few, a few, that's good. That's a few more than before. I wasn't taught that. Uh, and it wasn't until after I educated myself, after I got out of my vascular fellowship, that I began to realize that. 40% of men over the age of 40 will have impotence. 50% over 50, 60% over 60. It's an easy one to remember. 40, 40, 50, 50, 60, 60. And uh, the men who are impacted by impotence in their 40s, that's an early sign of atherosclerosis. So what's happening is, of course, you need blood flow down there for appropriate function. And when you start to have blockages, you don't have the blood flow. And then, you know, so then we've developed these medications like Viagra, Cialis, Levitra, that temporarily, they're very powerful vasodilators. So they temporarily increase the size of the blood vessels to allow more blood flow. But that's a temporary thing, and it's not treating the disease process. It's just a stopgap measure. Uh, and so the people continued on with their lifestyles, and they continue to develop more disease until those things don't work anymore and until they have a heart attack or a stroke or uh, they lose a leg. So just I want people to understand what I'm trying to get to is it's an early sign of uh, atherosclerosis or, or cardiovascular disease. So not only does atherosclerosis lead to these chronic debilitating uh, diseases that cause pain and suffering and, and a lot of inconvenience in life, but it leads to the ultimate problem, death. So cardiovascular disease is the number one killer of Americans. About 40% of Americans will experience some form of cardiovascular disease in their lifetime. I, I don't get to develop long-term relationships with my patients. 50% of my patients are dead in five years. And it's not because I'm a, not a good surgeon, okay? <laughs> I'm pretty good, I think I am. At least, I, at least when they walk in my door, I tell them I'm the best because they're gonna let me operate on them, so I want them to feel confident about what I'm doing. But what it is, is it's a reflection of all of their comorbidities. What does that mean? It's a reflection of all the other disease processes and all, how bad off they actually are. Because by the time they get on my, you know, my table, they all have hypertension, diabetes, coronary artery disease, and kidney problems. By the time they get to me, they've already developed a whole host of uh, chronic diseases. So how do you get atherosclerosis? It's largely a lifestyle-related disease. Most people think, you know, okay, my mom had it, so I'm going to get it. My dad, my, my dad had a stroke, so I'm going to have a stroke. My uncle had a heart attack, so I'm probably going to have it. But they kind of feel doomed to it without thinking or understanding. The way I tell people is genetics may load the gun, but it's our lifestyle that pulls the trigger. Okay, What we do in our lifetime determines whether that genetics turns on or off. And, and this has become very, very well understood in the last 10 years. And there's some, something called the science of epigenetics. Everybody in this room has almost identical genes. All human beings have 99.999% similar genes. Okay, but we all are uh, exposed to different uh, factors in our lives that turn, th turn genes on and turn genes off. And identical twin studies are actually some of the things they've used to prove this. You can take identical twins and, uh, who've been separated at birth, for example, and look at them and notice that they, they each uh, end up dying of very different reasons. So genetics didn't cause it. It was where they grew up and what their exposures were. And, and what I'm getting at now, too, is the number one most, export, the mo the most significant exposure we have in our lives, throughout our lives, is the food we eat. Okay. So I'm, I'm starting to drive that point home. So uh, it's not genetics. That's really responsible for less than 5 to 10% of all of our chronic disease. What is more important in the development of atherosclerosis is cholesterol, saturated fat, and processed foods, meat products. Okay. Uh, and let me talk a little bit about smoking because this is not a smoking lecture, but um, a lot of people believe that smoking is the cause of uh, our problems. Well, since 1964, when they first put a warning sign on the cigarette uh, packages. Smoking has declined in incidence every single year since then. Okay, So yet at the same time, atherosclerosis, chronic disease, and cancer have continued to increase. Okay, So you can't blame smoking. You can't blame everything on smoking. It's mostly our lifestyle and mostly related to what we, we put in our bodies. The traditional American diet causes whole body inflammation. I call it the standard American diet, SAD, SAD, okay? And it is an inflammatory diet. It's full of saturated fat and cholesterol and processed foods. 65% of the standard American diet is processed foods. Uh, things that, with preservatives, things that, with things that we can't even say, yet we put them in our bodies. How does this injury occur to the arteries? A direct injury actually occurs to that endothelium that I was talking about. And when injury occurs in our body, Typically, we, we rush white blood cells to the area and, uh, and different kind of hormones to cause an inflammation where we will then try to repair that. But what happens in the artery 
uh, with this chronic inflammation and constant injury is that we get more inflammation and it builds up. And, in, and then that, remember that picture of the artery on the right side, which I showed you? That was fibrosis, scar, cholesterol, and fat. Okay, it was an exaggerated response. And so we get this exaggerated response within our arteries and then it causes a narrowing. We have the other things that contribute to it, which are obesity, diabetes, and hypertension, all of which, again, are largely lifestyle-related diseases. All of these things put together, the cholesterol, fat, obesity, diabetes, and hypertension, are now what we call metabolic syndrome. And it's, these things go hand in hand, and they call a ho cause a whole host of problems in us as we, as we age. So how do we currently treat atherosclerosis? Well, we throw a lot of drugs at it and we throw a lot of surgeries and procedures at it. So basically what we're doing is we're treating the end symptoms or the end issues, but we're not treating the cause. So when we treat these people, either we're giving them a medication for cholesterol, well, we're, we're getting their cholesterol down, but the problem that's causing the cholesterol to be high is still there, okay? Or we might be giving them a medication to control their hypertension, but the, whatever the mechanism that causes hypertension is still there. And I might postulate that, you know, that is not good control of your hypertension. The, the, the damage is still occurring. Okay? The same thing with diabetes. We give a medication to try to manage the diabetes and keep the blood sugar down, but we're not doing the same thing that our body does. We don't control it as well. Instead, you know, when our body controls diabetes or, and we don't have diabetes, our blood sugar is between 70 and 100. When, uh, when we control diabetes uh, with medications, we aim for a blood sugar of 150. Okay? There are still going to be significant long-term consequences of having that high a sugar over the course of your lifetime. So we're not you know, we're not really curing these problems, we're just managing them. And, uh, and uh, these are stopgap measures. The thing I like to use in my practice is say, I'm just plugging holes and I'm putting out fires until the next hole occurs or the next fire occurs. But we're not getting to the root cause of the problem. So is there a better way to prevent and treat atherosclerosis? I finished my vascular fellowship in 1998. 1996 through 1998, I did a vascular fellowship, two years of intensive training in all things vascular. At that time, I had been taught that atherosclerosis was a chronic, indolent, progressive disease. You can't do anything about it. The people who, are get, it, who get it, they're going to get it. We don't know why they get it. Well, we, we knew the risk factors. All we can do is do an angioplasty, or do a stent, or do a bypass, or clean out the artery. And, and, and we're just taking care of that problem. Maybe it's in the neck. Okay? And then the next time that patient comes back to me, it'll be in the leg. Okay, and then the next time it'll be the kidney artery. So 1998, I finished my fellowship and I was taught there's n nothing we can do except plug the holes and put out the fires. So what if I told you then that most atherosclerosis is preventable and even some of it is reversible? Dr. Dean Ornish, many of you may have heard of him. Uh, he's considered one of the mo 100 most influential men of the 20th century. Uh, he's been on the cover of Time magazine. In the 1980s, he took patients uh, who had uh, coronary artery disease, bad coronary artery disease, and who were not going to get an operation or a bypass or a stent. And he divided them into two groups, the control group and the treatment group. Now the control group was the ones who were giving traditional best standard medical therapy, which was they were being followed by a cardiologist, they were told to improve their lifestyles, quit smoking, exercise, and eat right. But they didn't get any intensive work. That's just what they were told. And then they were said, go out and do it. Okay, that's the control group. That's how everybody was treated. And then he took a group of people and he put them through an intensive lifestyle therapy. And that, I say lifestyle, uh, the primary aspect of it was changing their diet. But at the same time, he also taught them to manage their stress. He got them to exercise. Now managing stress might have been, you know, whatever, you know, meditation, yoga, different things like that. But so it was a lot, it was that he tried to change their lifestyles and it was intensive and it was an inpatient program. After he finished the study, he looked at this and in the control group, the standard therapy group, uh, the disease kept progressing. It did, not, it did not reverse. In his treatment group, he reversed disease. His treatment group had less coronary events, less cardiac events, less death, statistically significant. This, this, this was such an important study that it was published in one of the most prestigious journals in the world, The Lancet, out of uh, the United Kingdom, published in 1990. Okay? And this is what's interesting. This was published in 1990. I finished in 1998, yet I was never taught this. Okay? And, 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 now, and I only discovered this in, in the last few years. Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn also did work on coronary artery patients. This is an actual angiogram showing a diseased artery, and two and a half years the same artery. This was actually a, a physician colleague of his 
who did not want to have his chest split open to have a heart bypass operation. And he went through that intensive lifestyle change, uh, went on a plant-based diet, uh, eliminated all salt, oil, and sugar, and processed foods and meat from his diet. And two and a half years later, his disease was gone. And that's a remarkable thing. What did these people do to uh, change their lifestyle? So the, one of the primary aspects of it was the diet. So it's a whole food plant-based diet. And I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that in a little bit more detail in a second. But it includes fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes. Uh, it includes a lot of green leafy vegetables. And for me, green leafy vegetables are, th that's my favorite because they got, they produce a lot of nitric oxide in your body. So if you actually have atherosclerosis and you want to reverse it, you need to flood your body with nitric oxide so your arteries can repair themselves because you're not making the nitric oxide as much as you should have because you've got diseased arteries. The other thing is that after the age of 40, we tend to produce less nitric oxide over time. So uh, it's important to eat your green leafy vegetables. And those are kale, Swiss chard, spinach, arugula, beet greens, romaine. And then of course include starches like potatoes, rice, and whole grain pastas. A limited number of nuts and seeds are very healthy for you. And eliminate uh, processed foods. So what does this diet not include? Well, it doesn't include meat. That includes fish. It doesn't include dairy, eggs. It doesn't include highly processed foods, of which oil is a processed food. Many people will ask me, well, what about uh, extra uh, virgin olive oil or what about sunflower oil? All oils are highly processed and they're bad for you. Eliminate salt. Salt is the number one contributor to hypertension in our society. We eat way too much salt. We're supposed to take in less than 1,500 milligrams of sodium a day. The average American takes in 3,500 to 4,000 milligrams of sodium a day. More than twice we should, and, and we wonder why we're a society riddled with hypertension. And then this diet does not include sugar, uh, added sugar. There are thousands of studies that have shown the hazards of the consumption of meat, dairy, salt, sugar, oil, and I will add egg and its bad effects on our blood vessels, organs, and bo bodily systems. Thousands of studies are out there like that, and I'll, I'll bring this up for a reason. There are also thousands of studies that show the benefits of plant-based foods for our health. There's also not one study in the literature, not one, that shows any deadly effects of eating fruits or vegetables, whole grains, legumes, nuts, and seeds. Okay? But there's plenty of studies that show the deadly effects of eating meat. Okay? And here's why I talk about the, the studies. It took over 7,000 studies before the Surgeon General finally decided to include a warning label on cigarettes. Meat is the new tobacco. Okay? We have thousands of studies that show the deadly and ill effects of consuming too much meat. Uh, and yet, well, there's no warning label on meat. Uh, we, we're a nation that believes that meat, you know, we should be eating meat. Or we're, we got blinders on and we're eating too much meat. So we are a pill-popping nation. There's a pill for everything. Yet we're still riddled with disease. Disease is getting worse. There's more coronary artery disease than ever. There's more cancer than ever. Uh, and so we're not really addressing the underlying causes of the diseases. And it starts with changing the way we eat. What does a typical day's menu look like? It's whole food, plant-based, minimally processed. There's, you can enjoy a variety of foods. You can still enjoy your favorites, but just prepared in a healthier way. Tacos, pasta, pizza, chili, nachos, burgers, etc. cetera. Um, here's some example, uh, kind of some think ways to look at them. The, the legumes, which are the beans, uh, all sorts of beans, like onions, garlics, and shallots, flowers, we call those the uh, cruciferous vegetables, thank you. Uh, and then uh, fruits, there's a, uh, a multitude of fruits, um, uh, other greens like celery, rhubarb, and asparagus. Again, my favorite are the leafy vegetables. Um, and then there's the roots, beet, potato, carrot, whole grains. Uh, are a very important part of this. Mushrooms, there's a multitude of health benefits from eating mushrooms. And then nuts, eat nuts in moderation because they are a high calorie food, oh, wow. one to two ounces a day. Eating whole food plant-based doesn't have to be boring and it doesn't have to taste bad. This is one of my favorites. Uh, I eat a potato three times a week, top it with lentil chili uh, and oftentimes asparagus or broccoli. Keep healthy foods around. Get rid of the potato chips and french fries and the processed foods and the nutter butters and the Oreos. Nutrient composition is really, really important. Plant foods are just extremely nutritious. And now when you look at this picture right here, this is looking at a 500 calorie meal of uh, a plant-based meal versus an animal-based meal. If you take a look at that top line, there's zero cholesterol in plants or in plant foods. Uh, and animal-based foods have 200 milligrams of cholesterol per 500 calories. Okay? Now look at the fat. We, you get, we do need a little bit of fat in our diet. Um, I suggest that people get about 10% of their calories from fat, not the standard American diet where we get 30 to 35% of our calories from fat. There's four grams of fat versus 36 grams of fat. Now look at this. To get more calories, 
from a plant-based meal, you actually have to eat a higher volume. But that's good. It fills you up. People who like to eat can actually eat more and still get the same number of calories. But the same calorie meal has the same amount of protein. So and as, an, as an example of that, 100 calories of black beans has the same amount of protein as 100 calories of meat. So it's important to understand. And then fiber, the dietary fiber in plants, 31 grams, no fiber in animal-based meals. We are a fiber deficient society, and I'll get to that in just a second. Uh, and then all these things, vitamin C, iron, calcium, beta carotene, vitamin E, folate, and magnesium. These are all vitamins and minerals. They all come from plants. Look at the hundreds or if not thousands uh, or tens of thousands of units from those and look at here on the, on the animal side, 4, 2, 4, 17, 0.5, 19, and 51. You don't get your vitamins and neutral, uh, minerals and phytonutrients and antioxidants from meat. It comes from plants. So what about fiber? People always ask me, and I'm sure everyone here has heard it, right? The, the vegans in the crowd, where do you get your, where do you get your protein, right? Well, we're, we are not a protein deficient society. I have never seen protein deficiency in my 22 years in practice. It doesn't exist in the United States, okay? But you know what does exist? Fiber deficiency, and no one's talking about it. 97% of Americans don't get the recommended daily amount of fiber. The recommended daily amount of fiber is 25. And in my opinion, that's too low, 25 grams. Uh, it should be 40 to 50, OK? Uh, when you go back, uh, or if you look at uh, some African tribes who eat high fiber diets who don't get cancer, they're eating 100 grams a day, OK? Um, and uh, so we are 97% of Americans don't get the recommended daily amount of fiber. And that, that's one of the reasons uh, uh, we are a colon cancer riddled society, riddled society. And I won't get into that because this talk is more about um, atherosclerosis. But there's fiber in every plant food. It helps eliminate toxins. It binds cholesterol and fats. So whatever cholesterol and fats you get in your diet, some of it's bound and then passes out of us because it doesn't get absorbed. Uh, it, fiber helps you feel uh, satiated and full. Okay, and then it's an important prebiotic. And what does that mean? It feeds our uh, probiotics. It feeds our intestinal gut flora, which we're beginning to understand is extremely important. Uh, if you ask me, probably the most important organ in our body is our intestinal system. And a part of that is the gut flora that exists in there. And we have to have the right balance of gut flora and we have to be feeding that gut flora. And that all come, and that an important aspect of that is the fiber. And so again, there's no fiber in animal products. So I'm going to switch to the next thing here, which is called calorie density. Plant-based foods are low calorie density. They're high in nutrients, but they're low in calories. That makes them an ideal food. You can eat a lot of it and, and not get, you can get full and you don't take in a lot of calories, but it's extremely nutritious for you. So if you look on the left side of this, that red line, on the left side is uh, plant, plant foods, legumes, uh, starches, potatoes, fruits, and vegetables. On the right side of it, all except for one thing, and I'll talk about the one thing, which is nuts and seeds. On the right side of it is processed foods and animal foods. If you think about it, let's, let's look at it this way. Caloric density, how does that affect us? If you eat 400 calories of fruits and vegetables, it's going to fill you up. So you can eat all the fruits and vegetables you want all day long. It's going to fill you up, keep you satiated. It's going to be healthy for you. Uh, and you're not, not only are you not going to get fat, I, I put a lot of my patients on a, this diet, and I tell them you can, eat all, you can snack all day you want on all the fruits and vegetables you want, and you're going to lose weight. Beans, grains, and potatoes, 400 calories. Uh, now look at animal products, uh, where it's, which is in the middle. So you're getting more calories. And again, it's not nutritious calories. Uh, and then to get to cheese. And then la lastly, oil, which is a highly processed food. One tablespoon of oil has 120 calories. One tablespoon. Think about when you go out to eat and they're sauteing your food in, in three or four tablespoons of oil. And just think about all those empty calories you're getting. And they're not filling you up and they're not doing anything for you nutritiously. Eating fruits and vegetables and, and uh, whole foods uh, are not only healthy for you, but they allow you to eat more uh, and, uh, and they fill you up. Carbs have been demonized in our society, but we need to make a distinction. A carb is not a carb. There's something, there are healthy carbohydrates and there are unhealthy carbohydrates. A potato chip is a carbohydrate and so is an apple, but they're not the same. Unhealthy carbs, candy, soda, pastries, donuts, sugary cereals, white rice, uh, because it's uh, the fiber and everything has been stripped from the rice and you're just left with a refined sugar. Um, white flour pasta, exactly the same thing, and then white breads. And what are the healthy ones? Fruits, green leafy vegetables, and uh, 
starchy vegetables, beans, lentils, peas, whole grains, corn, and pastas made from whole wheat, okay, or, or made from other alternatives like rice, uh, uh, lentils, quinoa. So uh, I, I tell Maya we like to experiment with uh, pastas made from, uh, you know, veggies and other things like that uh, because they're way more healthy and they have less calories. Is making this lifestyle change uh, difficult? We are faced with a whole bunch of habits, traditions, culture, social pressures that keep us kind of the way our society is. It keeps us the way we are. And so breaking out of that takes some effort. It takes some self-awareness and some recognition. We believe a social system is important, and that's what one of the things that Maya and I have tried to do with Plant-Based DFW is to create a community uh, for everyone. Um, and I tell people before you do this, don't just jump in uh, head first. Uh, prepare yourself. Um, and Do some research. Do some reading. Um, watch some docu documentaries. Check out the resources. Uh, talk to people who've done it. You know, we learned a lot of our knowledge about eating from TV and advertising. Um, and here's a few interesting ones. I'm sure you, many of you heard of these things. None of these say that these foods are healthy for you. They're just catchy jingles. I'll tell you, the, the one that got me uh, was, where's the beef? Here's an interesting fact for you. The World Health Organization has determined that processed meats, like bacon, sausage, hot dogs, and deli meats, are a class one carcinogen. That doesn't mean that they may cause cancer. It means that there's indisputable proof that they do cause cancer. Uh, and that puts them in the same category as asbestos, plutonium, and tobacco. Okay, all of those are class one carcinogens. We know those cause cancer. And so now we know that processed meats cause cancer. No one is getting rich from you eating a potato in a bowl of fruit. So there's no fruit lobby and there's no potato. Well, there might be a potato lobby, I don't know. Um, uh, one of my famous colleagues, Dr. Greger, says that there is no big broccoli lobby, but there is a dairy lobby and there's a multiple meat lobbies and so I kind of wanted to share with you you might be saying well what the heck is a vascular surgeon doing here you know giving this kind of talk and I used to say I, I admit it's a bit unusual but now actually I think it's it's a shame that I'm the only vascular surgeon in the country that I know who's talking to you about this okay and uh, so let me share the, there's both a personal pr path and a professional path as to why I got here personally I've always been interested in my health I worked out all my life, I ran, I was a middle distance runner. Um, I would run every day, I, I would feel bad if I didn't run. I used to work out a lot. In my 40s, I got hooked on P90X, and I did that for three years. And uh, one of the things that the P90X guy, uh, Tony Horton, but he said nutrition is 80% of the game. And so when, I, when it came from a bodybuilding expert like him saying that, it really got my attention, and so I paid attention to it, and I did pay attention to my t nutrition. And I really thought I had kind of got, gotten it figured out because I was in great shape. Uh, in my 40s, I was in the best shape of my life. Um, I wish I could say I'm still in that great of shape. But, um, but what I had done is I was eating an extremely low-fat diet, but I was also eating a very high-protein diet because I thought I needed all this protein in order to get in shape and build muscle. And so it was like 40% uh, uh, protein, 40% carbs, and 20% fat. fat. It was 45, 45, 10. Um, now, interestingly enough, uh, being a physician, I could kind of monitor my own health. Despite being in the, what, what I consider to be the best outwardly physical shape of my life, I was borderline hypertensive, my blood sugar was high, my cholesterol was high, my triglycerides were high. Okay? And so it, despite you know, doing all this stuff, working out six days or seven days a week uh, and spending all this time on my health, it was gnawing away at me that I was starting to get to that point where I knew by the time I was 50, I was going to be on multiple medications, something for my triglycerides, something for my cholesterol, something for my hypertension, and something for my prediabetes. Okay? And, and so my mind, I was ripe at that time for a new message. And fortunately, around that time, maybe in my uh, mid to late 40s, um, I heard Rip Esselstyn talk, uh, who's the son of Caldwell Esselstyn. I showed you the reversal of the heart disease there, that picture. Um, and then that piqued my interest, and I, I went and read Forks Over Knives, and I you know, looked at the China study, and I began to, uh, this, is, this is finally when I learned that diet has such a tremendous impact on our disease process, and I learned that you can actually re prevent and reverse heart disease. And so, uh, from a personal standpoint, I was ready to jump on board. Now, at the same time, professionally, I had started to become a little bit dissatisfied with my work. I loved what I did. I loved making a difference in people's lives. Uh, I could put my hands on somebody and fix something. But at the same time, remember I talked about the people coming back over and over again? The, I called them repeat offenders. I, there was a sense of dissatisfaction that I wasn't helping these people get better. Again, I was plugging holes and putting out fires, but I wasn't 
getting to the root cause of the problem. And so when I, when I started to learn about this stuff, professionally too, it made an impact on me and I started to teach this way of life uh, to my patients as well. Um, and so that's when my personal and professional paths kind of collided and you know, we, you know, uh, this became an important aspect of my life. And then it further developed. It wasn't just nutrition. We learned about the blue zones. The blue zones are the places in the world where people live to be have more centenarians than anywhere else. And basically they live longer and healthier. And so they've identified five places in the world where, uh, that are called blue zones. Uh, and by studying these populations, we can learn about what do they do. Well, interestingly enough, they eat mostly plants, 95% plant-based. Uh, they have a sense of community, they get plenty of sleep, um, they're very spiritual, uh, but these were common characteristics of these societies. Uh, and, uh, and then that led uh, Maya and I to the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. Uh, Joey so, introduced me as board certified in vascular surgery. I'm even more proud to say that I'm board certified in uh, lifestyle medicine. Just got it. So, uh, which is a part of my path to uh, trying to teach people how not to get sick. There's about 2,500 board certified vascular surgeons in the country. So they're all seeing the same thing I'm seeing. And I'm wondering why are they not coming to the same conclusions that I've come to. And that's why I'm saying it's, n I used to think it's odd that I'm here. Now I'm thinking it's a no brainer I'm here. And I'm wondering it's odd that they're not here with me. Let me sum up cardiovascular disease for you in one pretty little package. There are 650,000 cardiac deaths annually. That's more than there's ever been. We've made such an impact on coronary artery disease, but the death rates are going up. There's 140,000 strokes annually. There's 200,000 amputations annually. That's a million right there. So that's just, just those three things cause, and that doesn't include dementia, which is in the millions and is gonna get worse. It doesn't include the impotence in the millions. It doesn't include kidney failure. So it is the number one cause of death and disease in the United States. After our 50s, because this is about my patients, this, what I saw is that they were busy dying, not living. Um, and we all have atherosclerosis to some extent due to our diet and lifestyle. So now what I would say is, now that you know about it, what are you going to do? Thank you very much.